I hope. So before starting uh, with the first session of talks, I'm very happy to leave the floor to the uh, first speaker of today, Richard Brini, who is connecting from the ocean, apparently, <laughs> uh, who has the difficult task of inaugurating this today's uh, symposium. Uh, Richard, with um, other colleagues that are participating today as speakers or chairpersons, as uh, Napoleon and Petra, or others like uh, Uli Sauerland, Bart Gert, Dansperber, Deidre Wilson, has uh, attended the birth of experimental pragmatics and during these uh, 20 years has provided incommensurable contribution to the development of this uh, research area. Um, and I think this talk will be, first of all, a nice occasion for remembering uh, what's at the origins of experimental pragmatics, how this research field evolved and grew up in the past 20 years, and more importantly, in which directions were going. So thank you very much, Richard. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Filippo, and thank you, Valentina. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Is that okay? Let's hope it works. Yes, please. Try it. Okay. Okay, great. Is that working? Works. Yeah. Now, oh, this is the tricky part because I just need to um, do this. And now I need to do this. And now I'm good. Okay. No, great. Great, great, great. All right. Um, well, you know, wow and wow and wow. I mean, this is great uh, on a number of levels. And I'm really, really, um, I actually said I want to do this. I sort of, I sort of barged in. Um, uh, but I really want to talk about uh, what's been going on this past while. Uh, and because I was involved, not at the very, very beginning, but near the beginning, uh, I can give you a first hand on uh, how instrumental IRA has been, uh, not only in the intellectual development of XPRAG, but in, in its kind of practical development. And I'm gonna focus on that mostly in this talk, as well as give a bit of history. Um, and, but, you know, sort of, I guess, uh, my focus will be on things that I focused on, and you may think about the history of XPRAG in different ways, uh, and that's all fine. So there's a bit of, bit of me in there uh, like that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the future that sort of um, uh, enlarge on something that Valentina said at the very beginning just now. So um, anyway, so I want to thank uh, Valentina and Filippo and their collaborators on XPRAG.it for organizing this, and Petra, I guess, and Napoleon, whose idea it was as well, for organizing this wonderful event. Um, now, it turns out a lot of what I wanted to talk about uh, is actually in the preface of a book that Ira recently published, uh, and he sent me a PDF of the preface because, uh, embarrassingly, I don't have the book at home on my shelf, you know, reading it or pulling it down all the time. Uh, and so, um, you know, if, if um, you really wanted to uh, skip this talk, you could just pick up the book and read the preface and you'll get a fair idea of uh, what's been going on. Um, um, but I did catch up with Ira recently and um, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, the, the sort of beginnings of his journey into XPRAG. Uh, and I actually, I, I had it wrong. I thought, I thought he was a student of Sam Glucksberg, but in fact, Ira uh, did his PhD at a lab at NYU with David O'Brien and Marty Brain, who are working on some ideas about mental logic. And as Ira tells the story, uh, he was working in this lab, and he kept getting he kept getting interest, or his interest kept being drawn to um, uh, pragmatic pragmatic phenomena that his lab leaders kept saying, no, look, ignore that, just abstract away from that stuff and let's, let's work on, on our ideas about mental logic. Um, and so he, as he meant, as Ira himself said the other day, he said he was encountering this attitude of pragmatics as a trash can kind of view, uh, which you know, is well known amongst people of a certain generation. Um, but of course, you know, to only study human capacity for logical deduction limits not only your understanding of human thought, uh, as uh, this image from uh, taken from Dan Sperber's website from the people he studied in Africa and their wonderful symbolism uh, illustrates, uh, it not only limits your understanding of human thought, but also even your understanding of our logical reasoning ability. So. The idea is pragmatics is fundamental. And he found uh, on a trip to Paris, he crossed paths with um, Guy Pulitzer and Dan, eventually Dan Sperber. Uh, and there he found people who had similar ideas to his. 
Uh, and they formed the group, I forgot about this, but it's a really great acronym. They formed the group whose acronym was Le Grice, L-E-G-R-I-C-E. -E. Uh, and that group and the workings of that group, <clears throat> what came out of that group was the work, which were sort of the early work in experimental pragmatics, which we're celebrating uh, this in these, in, the, in these two days. Um, and you know the 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 title of this slide is is something that I really want to focus on in this presentation. That Ira found a join in experimental work. He found a join in, in, in psychological terms, right where the sort of the Gricean theorists said it would be in in his in his uh, exposition of children's response to uh, difference between children and adults' response to scalar uh, scalar expressions. Uh, he found exactly what you would expect if you were if you had the, the ideas of, of Dan or Grice on, 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 on pragmatic effects. And later work again with he did with Lewis, which I'm sure Lewis is, and others are going to talk about today uh, on, on processing scalar implicatures, revealed the same thing. The, the joins, what what where we can pull things apart in language and communication are right where these people in the Oxford Common Rooms were talking about many years before. And so this was really <clears throat> a kind of big step in the scientific study of, of uh, language and communication. Uh, and you know, that this particularly the 2001 paper uh, is, is you know, a landmark paper in that respect. And that's what really set a lot of people off. <clears throat> um, so going on to the history of XPRAG and as it were, the, the, the IRA's role in the organizational side, I've taken a quote here from that, the preface of that book I showed you in the first slide. Uh, and he's saying how he organized the workshop uh, with Dan Sperber in Lyon. And I have to say that I've included a picture of the buildings in Lyon because it's one of my favorite places to visit, especially the Carp Fund. Um, uh, and he lists the, name, the people who, who were involved in, in, in that workshop, which really, I suppose, is uh, um, practically speaking, the first ex prague conference, if you like. And uh, it was a, a kind of template for future events of this kind. And I want to highlight who was at that conference. Obviously, there, there are, actually, I just saw Deirdre, that Deirdre's here as well, and I should have highlighted her name, but people who are, are here today uh, at that workshop, so Ray, Robin and Ray and Deirdre uh, were there. Uh, and then there were the people from uh, uh, Iris Circle Le Gris in, in Paris, um, uh, including Dan as well, who I guess is not mentioned here. Uh, and, um, um, oh, that's interesting. Um, and, um, uh, and then, and then the, the, rest, the other, the other uh, participants um, uh, were from all kinds of different sub-disciplines of psychology and linguistics and, and philosophy. And I sort of color coded people by their sub-discipline, developmental, formal linguistic, linguistic pragmatic philosophy, reasoning, psycholinguistics. Uh, and they all had different kinds of points of views on topics which are like invite different points of view. And that is, that is the, the first uh, kind of uh, ex-prag event that was organized uh, in Lyon uh, by Ira and Dan. <clears throat> and uh, as Ira says, this led to a, a volume that Dan and I edited which would become a, mo a modest reference for this fledgling field, which is, I think, a wonderfully uh, understatement. <clears throat> okay, so um, the next thing I want to focus on is this idea of adversarial collaborations, which I think is, again, really, really important in the history of XPRAG. Uh, and again, it's something that, this is something that Ira brought uh, into the culture of XPRAG. So, um, uh, uh, Ira and, and Gennaro was one of the participants in Lyon, uh, and they really have different perspectives. <laughs> they, they, they don't agree on, uh, there are a lot of things that they don't agree on when it comes to uh, particularly scalar implicatures. Uh, and nevertheless, they collaborated on some experimental work, which resulted in this paper, which came out in Thinking and Reasoning 2002. Um, <clears throat> and notwithstanding these, the, the, the the disagreements they have about how to think about scalars, this uh, wonderful paper provides uh, further evidence for ideas uh, which they held in common, ideas about how you would expect 
when you would expect to find scalar implicatures to arise and not to arise, whether you're a Gricean or a relevant theorist about scalar implicatures, or like uh, Gennaro, a sort of you know um, grammatical theorist about uh, about scalar implicatures. And again, this is a, this is like finding joins right where the the, site, the the theory tells you that you'll find them. And that's an, another step forward, another kind of step forward and a validation for doing uh, experimental work in, in pragmatics. <clears throat> so it turns out that Gennaro's involvement in, in his interest in scalar and Picatures was part of a, a growing interest in the formal linguistics community really over in, in, in MIT and Harvard and places like that. Uh, an interest in particular in scalar implicatures. And around this time, Uli Zawalan was working on a paper in which he refines the Gricean account of, of scalar implicatures, rather contrary to the kind of paper that Gennaro was working on, which, which uh, was, and several others at the time, which were saying that the scalars were grammatical and things like that. <clears throat> um, so uh, in the context of this, again, adversarial, these two different perspectives, not only between say the formal linguists and the like linguistic pragmatics people, but even amongst the formal linguists and amongst the linguist pragmatics people, there was a, an adversarial kind of thing going on. So Gennaro organized uh, a conference in, in Milano two years after the Lyon event. <coughs> um, and uh, although I wasn't necessarily an important player in that conference, I wanted to share this photo with you of, of myself and, and Napoleon who got hooked into experimental pragmatics right around that time. And we and also Anna Papafragu was uh, working on her famous uh, developmental paper on uh, scalar and Picatures. And there we are all out having ice cream, the sort of pragmatics people. But also I, uh, Gennaro in, uh, invited the big guns of formal semantics uh, from, from uh, the East Coast uh, of America uh, and we had a wonderful uh, event discussing scalar and pictures, different points of views, adversarial collaborations, uh, all coming out of, uh, of these kinds of events. Subsequently to that, Woolley organized <clears throat> a network in Germany for, sem for semantics. Um, and a lot of the presentations in that network uh, were also experimental. <clears throat> So by now, Napoleon and I had caught the bug and we wanted to, in some ways, institutionalize this experimental pragmatics movement. And what better place to do that than in Cambridge, which if you've lived there for seven years, like I did, it is the epitome of the institutional town. Everything is institutionalized in Cambridge. So that's, that's a good place to start off uh, the official experimental pragmatics uh, conference. And we took our, our lead from Ira in designing this conference, we made sure we drew in people. So one of the principles of the XPRAG conference is that uh, you, if you're an organizer, we ask you to uh, draw in people, I invite people who are doing XPRAG but don't necessarily know it, that kind of thing. Um, and again, we made sure we include people who work in different areas with different and often opposing perspectives. So in these photos here, you see Mike Tannenhouse, Stephen Crane, Martin Pickering, and of course, Gennaro and Ira, Bart Hertz and Uli Zauland. Uh, and I've added included a picture here of Yi Huang, who uh, was one of the uh, accept submitted papers. And she was presenting her excellent work that she did with uh, Jesse Snedeker, uh, which uh, caused so many waves in, in later research. <clears throat> okay, so the next steps uh, in the development of XPRAG <clears throat> was to get uh, some serious funding for our fledgling institution or our fledgling network. Uh, and again, Ira led the way in putting together the first um, uh, funding proposal for an XPRAG network. Uh, by this stage, Bart Hertz was all in, and fortunately for many, uh, he was editor of Journal of Semantics. He and Uli and I worked with Ira on <clears throat> the grant proposal, uh, and we managed to secure some funding from the ESF. There were key players in, in that uh, group, uh, the sort of the nodes in the ESF network included Walter Skeichen, who whose uh, lab in Leuven uh, hosted several um, XPRAG events in the very early days, and also Louise McNally, who eventually, whose involvement eventually led to um, a, a meeting, an XPRAG conference being hosted in Barcelona. 
So Iris Vision, which you know the the Euro X Prague network was really Iris Vision, was the framework this framework of adversarial collaborations with a focus on interdisciplinarity. The idea is that you know particularly young researchers who are interested in 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 formal or theoretical linguistics would visit labs where you have a senior researcher to help them develop ideas or young experimental researchers would go and visit uh, uh, theoretical researchers. So with, there was a combination of senior and junior uh, mixes of disciplines and where possible adversarial collaborations. That is to say, you know, I've got a set of ideas and you've got a set of ideas. Let's develop an experiment to try to test, to, to uh, resolve our issue. And I don't have a complete list because they've lost in the midst of my old computers. I don't know where they are, but uh, this is the, the list of people who I could think of who were involved in these collaborations that were funded by EuroX Prague, who were among the leading lights in you know, formal linguistics, experimental pragmatics, developmental science, and all kinds of things uh, in, today's, in today's world. And I'm sorry if I've missed people off. <clears throat> of this uh, and someone can maybe uh, correct me uh, <clears throat> for any omissions. <clears throat> so where have we got to? Um, um, so I've chosen here, uh, I went, I spent, I don't know, <laughs> probably too much time uh, yesterday, I think it was, looking through every issue of Journal of Semantics from 2000 uh, to 2020. Um, journal Semantics being a kind of prototypical theoretical formal linguistics journal um, and uh, looking at to see how many papers report experimental results uh, in, in arguing for um, you know, theoretical positions in semantics or pragmatics. And it turns out in 2000, there were none. This is a graph that shows the, a five year rolling total of, of experimental papers. So the first, the first bar here is actually 2005. And you see from 2005 up to 2020, this rolling five-year um, total, uh, it keeps on going up. Okay. That's an illustration of in, within, the, within the domain of you know, what you might call formal theoretical linguistics, the, the importance, the, uh, the increasing importance that experimental work is taking. Uh, and, <clears throat> and so we got to a stage where now it's, it's the norm really to argue from experimental evidence to theoretical linguistic uh, conclusions. I've got as an illustration here, a paper by Mosh Barlev on a topic that's been around forever, how to deal with the, um, an ambiguity in plural definite descriptions. Uh, and the paper makes its case based on experimental results that have been reported in the five or so years previous to when the paper was published. So the, the author in this paper is building a case for a theoretical position based where the case is strong, it's based on experimental work. I, I would argue that where it needs, it needs to be strengthened is where experimental work needs to be done. Just to blow my, our own trumpet a little bit, my, the group I have working with Paul Marti, Yasu Sudo and Jacopo Romoli recently published a paper where we report new experimental results, but again, to argue for, uh, uh, you know, to, to demonstrate how these experimental results uh, can help us decide between two competing theoretical positions. <clears throat> so the, uh, the culture of, of using experimental work to resolve theoretical questions has become entirely embedded in, in formal linguistics in a way that, you know, when Ira first published his paper in 2001 is unimaginable. Okay. I think a lot of people thought it would be nice if it would happen, but, you know, it's hard to see how it happens. And now it's just the norm. Now, anyone who does a theoretical semantics or pragmatics PhD, they kind of have to learn how to do experiments, even if they don't necessarily want to do experiments themselves. It's part, it's part, of, it's part of the package now. For, for doing formal theoretical linguistics. And that's, you know, that's come out of, out of this work that was started by Ira and the group Le Grice, uh, back in the back in the day. <clears throat> Where we have got to, well, following on from Eurex Prague, um, Uli uh, got 
some funding from the German government to form XPRAG DE. And following on from that, Valentina and Filippo and others have secured this funding for XPRAG.it. And, and these uh, networks function in, in similar ways. They are all about putting people together, bringing people together for collaborations who come from different backgrounds, interdisciplinarity, and hopefully adversarial collaborations. Uh, and, these, and these extensions of EuroX Prague, if you like, uh, have enabled the roots uh, of experimental pragmatics uh, to be extended and spread across a number of disciplines. <clears throat> some of the things I want to highlight, some of, the, some of the places where we've got to that I think are important and impressive are represented by the two papers I've done a screenshot of on this slide. On the left, we have this very well-known paper by uh, Mike Frank and Noah Goodman, where they first set out their RSA model, the, Bayes, the, the so, so, so-called Bayesian turn in pragmatics, um, which at first I was quite skeptical of, but now I can see is really uh, quite an important step uh, in, in, in the development of, of XPRAG, or, or if you like, pragmatics as a science. Um, partly because uh, it opens the door for, for so, so one thing, and this is something I'm going to pick up on the next slide, is that we have a really rich and sophisticated um, uh, theory of how lang communication and language use in communication works. Uh, and it's built on solid foundations of good formal semantics, you know, uh, very good analytical uh, understanding of how um, utterances can update information uh, and experimental work. And, and it's a very rich picture and it's a very sophisticated picture stemming from Le Grice, uh, you know, in the Oxford common rooms in the middle of, middle of the 20th century through Dan Sperber, people like that uh, to today. <clears throat> and this work I, I can see as opening the door <clears throat> to, um, uh, for our sophisticated understanding of how communication works, uh, to influence computational perspectives in pragmatics and, and you know, you know get, a, get, a, get a better, un, get a, get a, to building better models uh, of how communication works. Uh, better mathematically uh, based models. <clears throat> In addition, uh, you know, as I said, the roots of experiment or of, of this understanding of how language and communication is, uh, has spread across different disciplines, including clinical research, neuroscientific research, of course, developmental research was there from the beginning, and ethological research. Um, and, the, and, the, and at least in some parts of these uh, disciplines, um, the uh, broadly Gricean pragmatic theory, or relevance Gricean pragmatic theory, if you like, uh, is, uh, is, it, is, being, uh, is infusing the ideas of researchers in those areas. <clears throat> and this paper by, co-authored by Valentina Bambini, I just uh, came across, um, it, you know, it's sort of, it sort of epitomizes that because um, it, it's, it shows how um, models of brain function and communication uh, incorporates ideas from ethology, from infant development, from uh, formal uh, pragmatics, you know, work on scalars and, and things like that, and experimental pragmatics, uh, to build uh, a model uh, of uh, brain function when it comes to communication. And this model really just incorporates those joins uh, one of which Ira found, uh, you know, way back in 2000. <clears throat> and so, you know, these I think, I think are promising developments uh, and, and they're avenues where um, the uh, XPRAG community uh, can, you know, take the science forward of, of understanding um, communication and language. <clears throat> where do we need to get to? Well, something that uh, Valentina mentioned, she said, oh, she often uh, finds herself saying, oh, XPRAG is a fledgling, it's a new field. Uh, and there's a sense in which, well, it kind of, it may, it looks a bit like a fledgling field because it hasn't necessarily caught on like wildfire. It hasn't spread across, it hasn't become so mainstream now that everyone, 
everyone um, you know, takes it for granted. And this is a paper that I came across, uh, you know, it's not necessarily even typical, but it's, a, it's by a very well-funded, so, um, uh, so where we need to get to is, 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 is to um, uh, try to uh, spread the ideas, spread, uh, convince people that the model that we have of how communication works uh, is very is very well supported and very well worth incorporating into their their own research uh, um, uh, work. So this is a paper reporting on a model of speech and communication by some very well funded people in the UK. This paper refers to nothing to do with <laughs> XPRAG at all. It's just got it's got zero it's got zero XPRAG in, in the reference list. And and this is the, this is the kind of the kind of research that is like in some ways translational. It's looking, it's looking, you know, to the future, to how how you know understanding the brain can work and so on using computational neuroscience. And so this is this is the these are the areas. This is the 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 way in which we. I think it's really it's you know as someone who's always uh, thought that these ideas are worth pursuing, that they are well grounded in 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 evidence. Then, then this is the step. These are the steps we need to take to, to spread the word, as it were. Uh, and um, the other thing I wanted to finish on, really, is um, another area where um, <clears throat> where we could um, do make where the development of the XPRAG ideas can have a really a positive impact. And that's to do with research in um, uh, language use in a social context. There's a lot of that been going on. There's always been a lot of research on language use in a social context context been going on. But I believe that there are many ways in which uh, we can make new and very positive contributions to the understanding of how language, these phenomena that people study when they talk about language use in a social context. Based on our, our sort of Gricean model of language and communication, <clears throat> um, and these contributions should they be made, and they are being made, to be fair, in in small in small increments, um, would sit in contrast to those that are based on a more undifferentiated view of language and communication. Uh, and I don't mean to pick on this paper. This is a recent paper by Penny Eckhart, published in 2019 in Language, um, which represents, as it were, the the the, the, advers the adversary in the adversarial um, kind of uh, dialectic. And um, uh, the um, <clears throat> as I say, it, it represents a very undifferentiated view of language and communication. Um, and at the the abstract starts out with the sentence, the structural focus of linguistics has led to a static and modular treatment of meaning. Apart from the fact that it's not quite clear what that means, what you do know is that it me it's meant to be negative. <laughs> being, st being static is not good. And, and I think it misrepresents where we are in, in going all the way from formal uh, semantics, pragmatics, through to what I've been talking about today, uh, the last thing you would say as a result of this last 20 years of XPRAG work and, and reflecting in great detail on the interface between language and pragmatics, between semantics and pragmatics, the view is not static, but rather dynamic. There is a, there are, there is a fluidity, there is an interface uh, between uh, semantics and pragmatics. So there's a sense in which the first sentence is meant to be negative and it, and it kind of misrepresents where we are in our understanding of semantics and pragmatics. The second sentence is where we bring in the picture that the author of this paper advocates. Viewing language as practice allows us to transcend bound, the boundaries of sub-disciplines that deal with meaning. In other words, we just look at language in an undifferentiated way. Um, and here the notion of practice, it's important to point out is a very um, non-psychological notion. It de-psychologizes linguistics. And I would say, and I'm, and I'm being somewhat contentious here, it opens the study of language up to ideological contamination and politicization. 
I would say that pragmatics is science. <clears throat> and we need uh, to show its value in interrogating language use in broader social contexts. <clears throat> and that's it. <laughs>